I greet you in the name of the Lord. What a delight and joy to come to you once again with Wednesday in the Word. As I have mentioned to you many times, these weeks pass by all too quickly. It seems like that it was just yesterday that we recorded last week's lesson. But I hope that you have found exciting your time that you have been spending in the Word of God. Let me first of all say I appreciate uh, your comments that you make and uh, look forward to see your reactions to the Word of God. My prayer is that the Word will be enriching to you. If you know me, I try to bring you uh, the background of the scriptures, so you get a great deal of history, because history is one of my passions. But I also try to go in depth to the passage itself and to pull out the spiritual highlights of the scripture. So um, that is what I hope to do today. Uh, our scripture lesson is going to come from the 27th chapter of the book of Acts. So if you want to turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 27. Now, this was the reading from July 9th and July 10th from the One Year Bible. I know some of you have told me that you have been struggling with uh, First Chronicles, but if you are continuing your readings, we are just about finished with uh, all of the genealogical portion of uh, First Chronicles. And let me point out to you, even in the long genealogical sections of First Chronicles, there are wonderful tidbits that you can find passages of information. Let me give you an example of that in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 9 and verse 10. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. And Jabez cried out to God, to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. And you will notice that that wonderful passage of Scripture falls right in the midst of all of the genealogical list that you have there. Uh, as you're reading the genealogies, just let me let you know that uh, your family, your genealogical line means something to the Lord. Your connectedness to families means something uh, as to uh, the Word of God. And uh, God wants you to know that you're not just a, a statistic, but that you are a very important part of the family of God. I want us to go to God in prayer as we begin our study today and ask the Holy Spirit to come and to anoint and give us insight into the Word of God. Holy Spirit, we welcome you today. We are thankful for the blessings of Almighty God. You truly have been wonderful to us. You have blessed us in ways that is too numerable to mention, but we want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the goodness of God in the midst of everything that is happening, everything that is taking place. You have shown your kindness, you have shown your love, and you have shown your mercies. So, Holy Spirit, enlighten our hearts, illuminate our minds, give us insight into the Word of God. Speak to us, O Lord, and those that are going through trials and tribulation, I pray that you would come and you would embrace them, place your arms around them, comfort them, 
let them know that they are not alone, but that you are with them. You have promised never to leave us and never to forsake us. And so, God, I just want to thank you for all of those that are listening to this Bible study. And I pray that it would be a blessing in the name of our Lord and our Savior. And amen. As we are turning our attention to Acts 27, let me remind you that uh, the book of Acts is a book of history. It is the only history book that we have of the New Testament church. It's an exciting book. It is a book that talks about the growth of the early church. And uh, as you read in the book of Acts, the church will start off, as it were, with a handful of people, approximately 120. In a course of 70 years, it will grow to over 1 million people. And so this evangelistic thrust, this great move of the Holy Spirit that takes place in this first century is exciting to follow as you're reading in the book of Acts. Um, our focus in large part is on the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. As you read the book of Acts, you will note that he makes three missionary journeys. And those journeys will take him into uh, about all of the Roman world at that time. He does not uh, travel as far as the extent of what is Great Britain, nor does he travel as far as to the extent of India, but he certainly uh, makes his way from uh, Jerusalem, from Israel, up into what is Lebanon, what is present-day Turkey, over into Greece, and finally uh, to Italy, to the very heart of the Roman Empire, uh, Rome itself. Now, it is believed, and one of the things that is important for you to understand as we begin this study, is that this is actually the fourth journey that Paul is making. He is not making this journey on his own. He is a prisoner at the time. Uh, he is being taken against his will, as it were, uh, to Rome where he will stand trial uh, before Caesar. Now, there are many Bible scholars that believe that Paul will be released uh, from this imprisonment and that he will travel as far as present-day Spain, only to be re-arrested uh, and brought back to Rome in which he will spend time in the Mamertine prison and then he will be executed uh, at uh, the age of about 65 uh, by Nero. He will have his head chopped off, and he writes to his sons in the Lord, I have fought a good fight, I have kept the faith, I have finished the course, and there is a crown of righteousness that is laid up for me, and not only to me, but to all those that love his appearing. Now, as we look at the book of Acts, you find that Paul has taken an offering uh, to the churches in Jerusalem. There was a famine that was going on, and Paul was very concerned about the needs of the poor Christians uh, in Jerusalem. So the Gentile churches, uh, particularly in what is present-day Turkey, uh, received an offering and they sent that offering at the hands of the Apostle Paul back to the churches uh, in uh, Judea in Jerusalem. While he is there, he is going to be arrested, and uh, he is then going to be transferred from Jerusalem to Caesarea. So when you come to the uh, about chapter 26, 27 of the book of Acts, Paul is in Caesarea. Caesarea is on the very coast of Israel, on the Mediterranean Sea. It was built in honor of the Caesars, and thus the name Caesarea. And uh, it was a beautiful city at that time, 
and it was the headquarters for the <coughs> Roman uh, Romans that were ruling over uh, Israel at that particular time. So we pick up, and I want you to notice with me as we come to chapter 27, uh, it was decided that we would sail for Italy. And Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. And we boarded a ship from Idrametrium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with them. And then he begins to chronicle the stops that they make along the way. So let's go back and uh, we read how that Paul was arrested. And uh, that was a plot by the Jews to kill Paul. Uh, Paul was made aware of this and he brought it to the attention of uh, those that had imprisoned him. <clears throat> and uh, because he was a Roman citizen, they're going to transfer him from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And uh, you would think, well, it should have been an imprisonment of a short duration. But by the time you come to the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, he has been imprisoned there for two years. And during this time, Paul has a trial before Felix in Acts 28. In Acts 25, Paul has a trial before Festus. And Festus is the su successor of uh, Felix. Then in Acts 25, <clears throat> verses 23 through 27, Paul appears before Herod Agrippa II. And uh, Herod appears with his sister Bernice, which is a very interesting thing when you study history because uh, Herod Agrippa II and Bernice are brother and sister, and yet they're living in an incestuous relationship. Now, they wanted, if you go back, Festus, to take him back to Jerusalem, but Paul knew of the plot on the part of the Jews that they wanted him dead. So at that particular point, he appeals to Caesar. Now notice, this is the right of Paul as a Roman citizen. He said, do not take me back to Jerusalem. As a Roman citizen, I invoke my right to be carried to Rome and to be tried before Caesar. In Acts 27, it begins with his sailing trip to the city of Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. Now, this trip to Rome and the ultimate shipwreck that takes place is some of the most exciting reading in all of the literature, whether it be sacred or secular history. The drama, uh, you're caught up in the action of the storm and then the shipwreck uh, that is going to bring Paul and those that are on board with him to the island of Malta. Now they are sailing in the Mediterranean Sea and they're hugging the coast of Asia Minor or present day Turkey. So if you are familiar with the geography, notice that they set out and they're sailing along the uh, coast uh, of present day Turkey or Asia Minor, as it is called by that time. They pass by the island of Cyprus and Snidus and Crete. All of these are islands in the Mediterranean. Now we know the time of the year. It was the fall uh, of the year when the Mediterranean is prone for storms. And they had difficulty sailing already and Paul had advised them 
that their sailing uh, was going to bring about harm, and he advised them not to sail. But in Acts chapter 27, verse 10, he said, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. The centurion, the Roman commanding officer over Paul, did not listen to Paul's advice, but he listened to the advice of the pilot of the ship and the owner of the ship, and so they decided to set sail. Ultimately, it was the majority of the opinion that won out whether they were going to sail or not sail. As I mentioned to you, we know the time of the year. It was the fall. In Acts chapter 27 and verse 9, it says, after the fast. And we know the fast is the day of atonement or Yom Kippur, which falls in the latter part of September or October because the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar and the date is a movable date from September to October. Now, the Romans considered sailing after September of the 15th as very doubtful as to the success, and sailing after November the 11th, they considered it to be suicidal. So the exact date, we are not certain, but we do know that it's the fall of the year when the Mediterranean is prone to these storms. Not long out to sea, the Bible says, a wind of hurricane force, or we know it was a typhoon. A nor'easter swept down from the island of Crete, and the ship was caught in the storm. Now I want us to look at the ship. This is no small boat. We know the exact number of people that were on board this ship. 276 people were on board the ship. So this is not just a small boat. It is a cargo ship. And there is room for 276 people to be on board this ship. <clears throat> and uh, it was a sturdy ship. It was a sailing ship. It was a ship that was made to sail in the Mediterranean. But even the largest of ships cannot deal with a hurricane or a typhoon that would arise in the Mediterranean Sea. So I want us to look at the storm. I want to ask a question. I want you to think about this. Did God cause the storm or did God allow the storm? Now let me give you my opinion. I believe that God allowed the storm. He did not directly cause the storm, but it happened to take place. Now let me ask you, when a storm comes as believers, what do we do? I can tell you this, that we are not kept from the storms of life. Many of you that are listening to me in the course of your life, you have faced many storms. There are many situations that you have been through. You've had to navigate the storms of life. And as you look back, you can say, to God be the praise for every storm he has brought me through and how good that he has been. So I want to let you know, we are not delivered from the storm. We are delivered through the storm. And there is a big difference. God didn't say that he was going to deliver you and me from the storm. But as in many cases we can testify, he has uh, delivered us through the storm. And I'm reminded of a passage of scripture that comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel and chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. This is a passage about what we refer to as the three Hebrew children. Well, they were not children. These were three young men that Nebuchadnezzar had ordered them 
to bow down to the idol that he had made. And if he, they did not bow down, they would uh, be cast into the furnace. And uh, I want you to look at the response in Daniel 3, 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And notice, he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. And basically, these young men are saying, King, you do whatever you want, but we're not going to serve your idol that you have erected. We're not going to bow down. And God can deliver us from being thrown into the furnace, but if we are thrown into the furnace, he is able to deliver us from the fire. Now, what happened in that particular incident? The scripture tells us that they bound the three young men. They threw them into the furnace. They heated the furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before to such an extent that those that threw them in were killed by the heat of the furnace. But all of a sudden, the king looked up and he said, didn't we throw three into the fire? And yet I see four and the countenance of the fourth is like the son of God. God himself showed up in the furnace and God delivered them. They were brought out of the furnace. There was not a singe on them. There was no smell of smoke. God had delivered them. And if necessary, from whatever furnace, from whatever storm that you may be facing, God will shield you. God will insulate you. God will protect you. And God will keep you. Now, some storms are more violent than others. I want you to look with me at chapter 27. And I'm going to read uh, a passage that begins with verse 15 down through verse 20. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cotta, we hardly were able to make the lifeboat secure. And when the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sartus, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. So notice the velocity of the storm. Notice how violent this storm is. Some of you had passed through storms and they were minor in length and minor in their ferocity. But some of you now are going through a storm that you have never faced in all of your life. I know that some of you that I'm talking to uh, right now are facing cancer. 
And for some of you, it has gone on for two to three years. But God is with you in that storm. He has not abandoned you, nor has he left you. The storm that we're all facing right now is COVID-19. In one way, it seems like it has been forever that we've been facing this. It's been since March when we were quarantined and uh, they lifted the quarantine. And as I am speaking, hot spots uh, in Florida and Texas and Arizona, hot spots in Tennessee with people that we are familiar with that have died from this virus. Uh, and uh, let's be honest, for all of us, uh, we are looking at a storm that seems like it has no end. We listen to the experts uh, and they say until we have a virus, uh, there is uh, no end to this particular storm except by God himself. Uh, and so some storms are more violent uh, than others. The next thing I want you to know, some storms last longer than others. When you read this particular passage of scripture, this storm lasted more than 14 days. And according to Acts chapter 27 and verse 27, as I mentioned, we've been going through the COVID crisis uh, since uh, early March. Uh, our schools are out and it seems as though that we don't even know if schools will resume uh, uh, this fall or not. Uh, we heard that California is under lockdown again. And what does the future hold? Uh, I know that if you're not careful, you can allow fear to grip your heart and you wonder, Lord, uh, how long will this storm be? But I have good news for you there will be an end to the storm. Uh, I read about the great uh, Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. They never found a vaccine uh, for that flu, and it was simply a herd immunity when more than 50 to 60 million people had died on this planet, then all of a sudden, that flu came to an end. I don't know what the cessation of this flu will be, but I can tell you there will be an end as it relates to this flu. Now, there are two emotions that you can have in a storm. You know this without me even telling you. You can either have fear or you can have faith. Let me ask you, what are the emotions that you are having or you have had? And may I be honest with you, as a pastor speaking to you right now, in the past few months there have been times that fear wanted to grip me. And I may have had a cold and I thought, oh, is this the COVID virus? And you have to come to your senses and say, devil, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. I am trusting God. I am depending upon his word. I'm depending that he is going to see me through this. Fear comes from focusing on the storm. And may I tell you, whatever storm you are passing through right now, don't focus on the storm. Do you remember what happened to Peter when the Lord bid him to come to him to walk on the water? As long as he kept his eyes on the Lord, he was fine. He could walk on the water. But when his attention was drawn to the wind and the waves, what happened? Fear gripped him and he immediately began to sink but I'll oh, thank God the Lord was there and reached out his hand and he pulled him out of the water. And so don't beat yourself up if you've had times of fear and whatever storm that you're facing, but refocus. Readjust the lens of your life and focus on the Lord and allow faith to take over the fear that the enemy would like to bring into your life. While God is not the cause of the storm, he ultimately is the one 
who is in control of the storm. Now, define the storm that you are going through. Know this, God is not the author, but he is in control. One thing that we will never do, we will never give over to the devil and let the devil have his say. God is the one who has the staring mechanism. God is the one who is able to say, peace be still. God is the one who is able to bring you through the storm that you are facing. Now God's concern, and this is amazing to me, is not just for you, but God's concern is for your family and for those that are around you. Notice the passage that we're looking at. God's concern was not just for Paul, but God's concern was for all 276 people on board that ship, according to verses 34 through uh, 38 of the 27th chapter. It lets me see the mercy of God, the compassion of God, the goodness of Almighty God. In the midst of the storm, God showed up to Paul and he said, tell the people to stop their fast, go ahead and eat, because not a person on board this ship will lose their life and they will all be saved. And so God is saying, yes, I'm concerned about you, but I'm concerned about your family. I'm concerned about your loved ones. Now, a diversion in your plans is a divine opportunity for God. What was the plan for Paul? As far as Paul is concerned, his plan is for God to get him to Rome where he can stand trial before Caesar. But notice, in between, a storm arises. There is the diversion. It's going to be some time before he ever reaches uh, Rome. But the diversion in the plans of Paul was a divine opportunity for God. You might look at the storm that you're in as a diversion, but God says it's a divine opportunity for me to work. What does God want to do in your life? What does he want to accomplish in your life? In Acts 28, there is the ultimate shipwreck. The ship uh, is broken to pieces. Some swim to shore. Some take parts of the ship that has been broken up and they are able to make their way to the shore. Uh, let me remind you, it's fall of the year. It's already beginning to get cold. Uh, and when Paul uh, is finding himself on the island of Malta, because it is cold, he went to, to pick up some firewood to make a fire. And all of a sudden, there was a snake that was in the firewood, and it latched on to the hand of Paul. Now those around Paul said, oh, this man must be a horrible individual. Though he's been spared from the storm, fate would not allow him uh, to go unscathed. But what did Paul do? He shook the snake off back into the fire. He knew that God had a plan and he had a purpose for his life. And the serpent was not going to short circuit the plan that God had for his life. And out of that becomes this opportunity because the head of the island, his father is sick with dysentery. And Paul takes the opportunity. He goes into the house of Publius' father. He lays hands on him. He ministers to him. And God heals him. So you see, the diversion in Paul's life was a divine opportunity for God. Notice Acts 28. Paul then finds himself 
on this island of Malta. And Paul could have said, I'm not supposed to be on Malta. I'm supposed to be in Rome. But God had plans for Paul on Malta. May I tell you, God has plans for you right now. Whatever your storm may be, whatever the swirl in your mind and the chaos that is around you, God is saying, peace, be still. And he says, I have a plan and I have a purpose for you. So every event was a piece of the puzzle for the purpose of God that God had for Paul's life. So every event that is taking place in your life. Uh, on uh, the 13th, I celebrated my 75th uh, birthday. And I can look back on the 75 years of my life and every event has been part of the puzzle that God had for my life. And may I tell you that every event that you have gone through, every storm that you have gone through is a piece of the puzzle. When you look at the piece, you can't see the whole picture. But when all the pieces are put together, you can stand back and you can say, to God be the glory. I see the purpose that God had for me or has for me. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the peace of God that he would give to you right now in your storm. And I'm going to ask God to allow you to step back and to put in focus the events that have been happening in your life that you can see this marvelous mosaic that God has been framing in your life to bring you to where you are. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word and the power of your word. We thank you that we are still under construction and everything that we are facing, Lord, you have control. You are still sovereign. I ask God for the peace of Almighty God to be spoken over the lives of those that are listening to me right now. Grant, Heavenly Father, that rather than fear, faith would grip their hearts and they would feel the very peace of Almighty God. For it's in Jesus' name I do pray and amen. Never forget how much we love you, how much we are praying for you, and may God's peace be yours until next week. God bless you.